February 1942, 533 Pennsylvania Avenue, Manila. As each week dragged by, Florence became increasingly apprehensive of the growing menace from their occupiers. She gave up the once pleasant task of walking her little dog and turned it over to Mariano. On the few occasions she was forced to venture out during the day, she couldn't walk more than a half-dozen blocks without being stopped at one of the military kiosks and asked for her identification. One morning she did not bow sufficiently deeply from the waist in the traditional Japanese way to a soldier, and he cuffed her on the side of the head. Over and over she watched soldiers slap or punch people for no reason at all, sometimes kicking them into the street. Many obviously enjoyed the power. At one of the military checkpoints, a soldier put his hands on her breasts while pretending to search for contraband. As much as his crude actions infuriated her, she could only endure them as part of the new reality of the occupation. Japanese officers were now living in the homes in her neighborhood, once owned by British and American residents. Often she could hear them late into the night, drunkenly singing songs, or staggering down the avenue in the morning after an all-night party. Much uglier was the proliferation of Japanese service clubs around the city. Margaret learned that Filipino women were being recruited or forced to work in them. Lines of soldiers often stretched down the block, waiting to enter. There were also rumors of young Filipino women stalked by Japanese soldiers on their way home before curfew and found the next morning wandering naked and disoriented. Late one night, Florence heard men's raised voices outside the house, followed by loud hammering at the front door. She hid with Margaret and Olive in one of the bedrooms until they finally went away. Before going to bed each night, Florence sat at the kitchen table in the darkness and listened to the latest news on Bing shortwave. The Voice of Freedom radio station was still broadcasting an hour-long program from Corregidor, and its news reports indicated the battle was going well. The radio stations in San Francisco and Australia delivered all the bad news. The fall of Hong Kong was followed by the collapse of the British and Australian armies in Malaya. The Japanese had driven the Allies all the way down the Malay Peninsula, and the mighty fortress of Singapore was now under siege. If help was coming to the Philippines, no one was talking about it. Each day, Mariano came back from the markets to tell her that the price of staples like fish, milk, tinned meat, and rice was higher. Each week, the cash in the envelope that Bing had given her continued to shrink. Florence and Dolores Gardner were working hard to collect food and medicine they could bring to Bob Hendry and his friends in the Santo Tomas prison camp. Florence made her own small donations and asked others to help too. The combined results of their efforts were pitifully small. Through long, mostly sleepless nights, she lay in bed and listened to the distant thunder of shell fire from Bataan, Cavite, and Corregidor. The depth of her loneliness was overwhelming, a constant ache. Mostly, she missed the treasured sanctuary of being held safe in Bing's arms. He was only twenty-six miles away on Corregidor, but it might as well have been a million.